Hello, my name is Charmaine Kavitoff, and I'm the Research Ethics Board Consultant here at the Research Ethics Office, the University of Alberta. Today I'm going to be speaking to you about research ethics in human participant research and why it is important. Why do we have research ethics review? Because history tells us that there have been plenty of examples of abuse in human experimentation. These examples have led to guidelines that look at the ethical treatment of human participants. Uh, along with this recording, I asked you to review the Tuskegee experiment, which was a brief YouTube video. In there, there are many examples of ethical concerns that should have been addressed and weren't uh, within this experiment. Issues of deception, uh, issues of conducting this kind of research with a vulnerable population that really didn't have a voice, um, issues of coercion, um, offering them free meals, hot meals, things that, that they wouldn't have normally had. We'll speak about this more, I'll address this more as we go through this, this presentation. But the, the important thing to remember is that from an ethical point of view, the goal of research should be to protect participants by minimizing the harms or risks to which they are exposed. We think that these things are in the past and that these kind of um, transgressions don't occur today. And while they may not be as overt and as, uh, as they were in the past, and we've come a long way, there are still many ethical concerns that take place within the conduct of an entire research project. For example, some of the complaints that we've received in the Research Ethics Office are uh, complaints from students uh, who felt that they were being coerced by their professor to participate in the professor's research for which the students would have been the participants. Because the professor was also involved in a, their assignment of grades for the course that they were currently taking, there was a level of coercion that needed to be addressed and was not. There's also a situation where a researcher lost an entire laptop that contained both research data and the participant identifiers. And because the privacy and the confidentiality settings and uh, pr processes around that weren't very good, um, it was able to link, you were able to link the data to the actual participant identifiers and one's confidentiality was lost. We also had a complaint by a participant who was emailed uh, about a participation in the study, but the research coordinator, instead of just sending uh, either single emails or using a blind carbon copy uh, to all participants, actually CC'd everyone so everyone, any participant could know who else was taking part in the research. There's no confidentiality, which is something that the Research Ethics Board looks for to ensure that. <clears throat> So a little bit of history, the Nuremberg Code was struck in 1948 uh, following the World War II transgressions, the Germans' uh, experimentation, and the fundamental principle that arose from that was that voluntary informed consent is essential. Uh, some years later that was revised into the Declaration of Helsinki, and while it was more geared towards medical clinical research, it is the cornerstone document of all human research ethics uh, guidance going forward. It recognizes the well-being and respect for participants at the foremost, right to self-determination, and again highlighted the importance of informed consent. The Belmont Report came out in 1978 and was inspired, in fact, by the Tuskegee experiment. From that, three principles of research ethics were identified, and these remain in effect today. These principles include respect for persons, concern for welfare, and justice. Essentially, these, these highlight that you cannot treat your research participants as mere objects, that they are thinking, human, thinking feeling human beings um, that have a right to self-determination, they have a right to be treated fairly, and that we can't just use them to advance our own research gains. We must consider these things and ensure that their participation in their, your project does not uh, increase any particular risk to them and may actually be of some benefit, or at least that the 
level of risk, it does not outweigh the level of benefit. <clears throat> All research that involves human participants or their biological materials must be reviewed by a research ethics board before the research commences. It's important to note that re our definition of research as per the Tri-Council policy statement is uh, it's defined as an undertaking intended to extend knowledge through a disciplined inquiry or systematic investigation. What is human, what constitutes human participant research? This is not necessarily just the direct interaction with participants where say you give them a survey and they complete it and then you have some data. This could also involve human participant data, data that's already been collected about a human participant, such as information from health records, information from data sets that were accumulated from previous research projects. This is still human research ethics, human subjects research that requires ethics review and approval. So even if it's funded or not, but if it's conducted by staff or students of the University of Alberta, uh, whether it's conducted in Canada or abroad, on or off university property, in a lab, in the field, virtually, uh, whether your intent is to acquire basic or applied knowledge, whether the project is a pilot study or a fully developed project, it requires ethics review and approval. If you're not sure, you should check it out with the Research Ethics Office and that actually would be myself. You could send me an email and um, I can help you make that determination. Sometimes you might think that something doesn't require review and approval only to find out that it does. The importance in this is uh, uh, on many levels. There's an academic implication of conducting research without ethics approval. Um, there might be, depending on your data sets, there could be fines for accessing data outside of uh, ethics review and yeah, it could jeopardize your academic future. You need to seek ethics approval before a project begins and in the case of funded research, before funds are released. You need to maintain ethics approval for the life of the research project. That means so long as there is data collection occurring and or human subject participant interaction, you must have valid ethics approval. You do not need ethics approval to analyze your data or disseminate it. Any changes you make to the approved research after it's been approved must be submitted to the Research Ethics Board before you implement them. So as previously stated, university faculty, university students, anybody external but is conducting the research under the jurisdiction of the university, Essentially, if you have any affiliation with the university, you need to seek ethics approval for your human participation research. <clears throat> so as I previously stated, ethics review is geared towards protecting participants uh, by minimizing the harms or risks to which they're exposed. How do we do this? This requires you to submit a fully detailed uh, ethics application to us that outlines risks and benefits uh, your procedures for informed consent, your procedures for screening and recruitment, and as well as a description of the research project, including how it will be conducted and analyzed, and your provisions for privacy and confidentiality, uh, both the research participants' involvement as well as the, the storage of their data post-study completion. We have a research ethics um, application process that is online. It's called Arise, and we have a, a really good iterative electronic application form that addresses all of these um, sections. I just wanted to go through them with you to highlight when you are, you know, thinking about the design of your project, things that you need to consider. And I understand from your professor that there might be some, uh, some of this might not apply, but it's important for you to think about even in in your mind, what might be the simplest uh, ethics or research project, there are still ethical considerations that must take place. So we take a proportionate approach to review when we're looking at the risks. So 
uh, we have a definition of minimal risk, and that is the amount of risk that a participant could expect to experience in their everyday life. So things like completing a survey, things like, uh, in your case, maybe participation in online, uh, playing a video game, would be in that minimal risk category. One could expect an individual to encounter those things in their everyday life. Um, so that would be considered minimal risk. There are some factors that increase the level of risk to a study, and that those could be physical, psychological, economic, social, there could be risks related to loss of privacy. So these are all things that we consider. Where these risks are increased, then uh, a more um, thorough ethics review will take place. In fact, it might be reviewed by our full research ethics board and you might have to come and, and address these concerns. The REB wants to be sure that there are some benefits to this research. Uh, so these, there can be direct benefits to the participant. Um, most often there are not, but that needs to be highlighted and stated for the participant. There can be indirect benefits. Perhaps they're completing some kind of um, tool online that might give them a score that they may that may be of interest to them, such as a hearing test or um, some other cognitive test, for example. Um, barring there being any direct or indirect personal benefits to a participant, there may, of course, be the benefit of advancement of knowledge. <clears throat> the Research Ethics Board takes uh, great care to, uh, to review the recruitment of participants. When you're designing your research project, you should think about who your participants are. Who do you want to take part in your research? Who are they not? Do they have the capacity to consent? How will you identify them? And then how will you approach them? There are many uh, causes for ethical concern within this process. The Research Ethics Board needs to review any documentation that you will uh, put before a potential participant uh, to invite them to take part in your research. There is use of social media, there is use of advertisements, there are, uh, you know, finding participant lists, uh, for example, the student population at the University of Alberta. How will you identify them? Have you gone by all the appropriate means to identify them uh, in those cases? And then how are you approaching them? Are you sending them an email? Are you putting up an advertisement. The, the, we do have uh, some recruitment guidelines. I've included a link for them at the end of this presentation um, to help you think about the ethically appropriate ways in which you approach participants. Are you offering them any incentives to take part? Are those incentives proportionate to what you're asking them to do? For example, are you asking them to, to will participation take a half hour of their time. What's an appropriate um, remuneration for that amount of time? Uh, if they are doing things, playing a video game, for example, uh, we typically say that an appropriate amount of compensation would be equivalent to one hour's of minimum wage. So you could offer them up to $15 uh, to do that. Anything more than that, we would need to look at um, whether that then becomes coercive. Offering somebody $100 to do uh, 30 minutes of participation from their laptop in their home is most likely coercive. We also need to look at who is approaching the participant. Do they have any uh, relational power over that individual? Is it your professor who's going to approach students? Is it a physician approaching their patients? Um, is it a boss approaching their employees? Uh, who is sending out that original um, letter of or invitation to participate? So these are things that you need to consider. If it's a student uh, recruiting their student with a parallel relationship, not a problem. Informed, ensuring that participants' participation is fully informed is imperative. The Research Ethics Board 
has templates and guidelines on our website with the, I have the links again at the back, to ensure that all of the appropriate elements of informed consent are included in your any consent document that you might derive. So consent needs to be voluntary. Uh, participants need to understand that they can withdraw at any time. And if they can't withdraw, say for example, it's an anonymous survey where you don't have the ability to withdraw their data, that they are informed of that. Um, if they do withdraw, can they also request the withdrawal of their data? Is that possible? If it's not, that might be okay, but you need to inform them of these things. <clears throat> Consent must precede the collection of or any access to research data, and it must be ongoing. If something changes within the course of your research project, you need to inform the participants of this before moving forward. <clears throat> data confidentiality and the privacy of the individual is of utmost importance. You need to describe or think about uh, how to you need to describe to the RIB and think about how you will store your research records, both during the collection of data as well as post data collection. How are you keeping their identities confidential uh, in an electronic format? What, what sort of policies, what sort of processes are there to ensure that nobody else has access to the information that they're providing and more importantly, the link to their identification? So if you're using a database, what sort of security do you have for that database? Are you using a laptop? The university has policies on this available in UAPL, and in particular where identifiers will be included. That data electronically at minimum must be encrypted. If you're keeping a master linking log, is that log should be held separately uh, from the research data. If you were using uh, information uh, that would be deemed health information under the Health Information Act, any violations to this uh, could result in fines of up to $50,000. So as I gave in a previous example, um, it's very important that you protect the privacy and the confidentiality of your research participants and the information that they provide at all times. Post data collection, how are you storing that data? Where are you storing it? Who's responsible for it? If it's in an electronic format, is it in a place that's safe and secure? Who will have access to it? These are the things that you need to think about and describe to the research board. So in this pandemic era, there have been a lot of move, there's been a lot of movement towards uh, the conduct of virtual research. Uh, interactions between participants both for recruitment, consenting, and the actual data collection have moved to a virtual uh, format. And in fact, this is the preference of the university at this time. Uh, where research can be conducted virtually, it should be. So as a researcher, uh, you need to be familiar with your electronic platforms. You need to understand the privacy and security policies that these platforms have if they are not your own and to ensure that they meet the university standards at minimum. If you are unsure, I would advise you to check with the Office of Information and Privacy. They can run a data and security check on your uh, platform. If they haven't already, they may have one and be able to just provide that for you, uh, but they are extremely helpful. Unfortunately, it is just beyond the purview of the Research Ethics Board to know all of the platforms and or do we have the resources to be able to uh, ensure this on our own. If you are going to use recordings, whether those be audio or video or um, otherwise, you need to consider how these are stored. If you're using Zoom, for example, and you record within the platform, it records to a cloud that is outside of the, um, it's actually a cloud in the USA and therefore uh, subject to U US privacy legislation, which does allow uh, their Homeland Security uh, officers to view that data. It's preferable that everything be held on local servers. If you're going to be corresponding with or collecting data, data with your participants via email, both the university and the Research Ethics Office have policies pertaining to this use. 
Well, we're just sort of wrapping up, so I will just give you some links. Um, you can check us out at uab.ca slash Rio, Research Ethics Office, for updated information about the Research Ethics Office and ARISE applications. Um, I've provided you a link to the Tri-Council Policy Statement, which includes links to their tutorial. This is the guiding ethical document for uh, how we base our, our ethical re reviews here in Canada as well as the UAPL Human Research Ethics Policy. We also have very specific guidance that can help you uh, think about uh, when you are conducting your research, um, how you can obtain oral consent, deciding whether something requires ethics review or not. We have specific recruitment guidelines that are very uh, detailed, as well as there's a link to our email to communicate with study participants. When the university is back, <laughs> we are located in the North Power Plant. We just moved there last month. We have some swanky new offices that we may get to see sometime in 2021. Um, but if you have any questions about what we discussed here today, concerns about the design of your research project or any ethical concerns, I'm happy to chat with you. I am the Research Ethics Board Consultant for all Research Ethics Boards, uh, but I also do maintain a small file load with the REB3, which is the health files. Um, these are the specific uh, Research Ethics Board specialists who can answer your specific questions. It would seem to me that unless your study involves health information, you would be sending your applications to Ann Wally at REBs 1 and 2. She's very helpful and is much more technology savvy than myself actually and uh, she would be who you could direct your questions to as well. We also have a help desk should you get to that point where you need to submit your ethics application and you have some technical concerns or questions regarding the actual uh, platform. Uh, Connie at our uh, office, Rio office, and she's also our help desk person can be reached at that number and there's our website.